In this course you will learn how to make a tank combat game from start to finish. You will learn the c -sharp programming language and use the Unity engine which is the world's most popular game engine for indie game development. Just like the content on my channel, this course is very dense, cramming as much information as possible into each lecture. So don't worry if you have to pause or go over a section again. We start by covering the basics of Unity, then move into programming while creating a player movement system. The course does gradually move into more advanced topics like coroutines, game physics and enemy AI. All the assets and 3D models you're seeing are included with the course, so feel free to join up if you're interested. In this first video we will install the Unity game engine and Visual Studio alongside creating our project folder. Feel free to skip the installation section if you already have Unity and Visual Studio installed. Start by heading to unity.com. This is the website where we can download Unity Hub which will allow us to manage Unity projects and installations. Once you're on this page, click the Get Started button. Then, you're greeted with a bunch of Unity packages. Click the Individual tab. We're going to be using the personal version here, but if you are a student, that plan is very similar and you're perfectly fine to use it on this course. As you can see from the fine print, you must be making less than 100,000 a year from your games to be eligible for the personal plan, which is honestly a pretty nice threshold. Click Get Started, then Download for your operating system. Once the download is complete, open it. Then choose a location on your computer and click Install. Now open your shiny, freshly installed Unity Hub. You might be asked to create a Unity account here. Once you've done so, we can begin installing our editor. On the left hand side you will see some menu options, so click Installs. Then click the Install Editor button. As you can see, this hub is where you can manage and install different versions of Unity. This can be very useful if you're working on an old project or want to try out some new Unity features. For this course, we'll be using the recommended current stable version of Unity, specifically 2021.36F1. Now, don't worry if you're watching this in the future, the fundamentals of the software are consistent and you will be able to follow along with a newer version. After clicking install, you'll be shown a list of add-ons for Unity called Modules. The only one you need for this course should already be selected and that's Microsoft Visual Studio. Make sure this box is ticked and click continue. Once the editor is finished installing, we can now go to the Projects tab. Here, you will be able to manage all of your Unity projects. So let's make our first game project, which is going to be a 3D tank game. Click New Project, then select 3D and then give your project a title. Also, make sure this is in a good place on your computer. Personally, I like to have all of my Unity games in a games folder. Click create and once your project has finished compiling, you will see this window. So welcome to Unity. I can imagine this is a bit overwhelming right now, but the first thing we're going to do before we get stuck in is make sure Visual Studio is linked. At the top of the screen, click edit. Then we're gonna go to preferences, external tools, and make sure Visual Studio is selected. Congratulations, you have installed Unity, Visual Studio, and created your first project. In the next section, we're going to be getting stuck in with the Unity editor. I'm going to start off by explaining each section of the Unity interface. First off, at the bottom portion of the screen, we have the Explorer or Folder Manager. Essentially, when we created our project, Unity Hub generated a folder at the chosen location on your computer. The Explorer works as a shortcut to add, edit and navigate this folder. As you can see right now, we are in the Assets folder and Unity has automatically made us a Scene folder too. If we go into the Scenes folder, we can see our current scene which is displayed in the centre, which brings us to the next section, the Scene View. The Scene View is almost your interactive view into the world you're creating. You can use the scene view to select and position scenery, characters, cameras, lights and all other types of game objects. You can navigate the scene view using these shortcuts. Holding right click will allow you to pan around the scene. Scrolling the mouse wheel will allow for zooming in and out. And holding down the mouse wheel will allow for moving around the scene. Next up we have the hierarchy which is located to the left of the scene view. This contains every game object in the current scene. As you can see in our sample scene by default we have a main camera and a directional light. You can click on these items in the hierarchy to view them or double click to move to their location in the scene. Clicking on an object will open another panel on the right hand side. This is known as the inspector. 
We use the inspector window to view and edit properties for almost everything in the Unity editor, including game objects, Unity components, assets, materials, and in-editor settings and preferences. If we click on the camera and look in the inspector, we can see the object's components. For example, we have a transform component for the location of this object in 3D space. This contains the position, location, and scale in each axis. Next, a camera component is also attached. Here, we can see all of the current settings for our camera. We also get a preview in the bottom right of the scene view for the camera's perspective or player's view. Players for our game won't have access to all these fancy tools and they won't even see the game from the scene view. The player's perspective can be seen in the Game View tab. The Game View is rendered from the cameras in your application. It represents your final published application. This is what your players will see. For example, in a first person shooter the camera might follow the player, but in a puzzle game the camera might stay in a particular location. Manipulating the transform component on the camera will change its position. A simple rule of thumb is game view for testing and scene view for editing. We can test our game by clicking the play button at the top of the screen. This will pull us into the game view and allow for testing of our current project. It's very important to exit play mode once you're done testing, as changes inside of play mode aren't actually saved. Luckily, it's easy to tell whenever you're in play mode as the button is highlighted. Simply click it again to exit play mode. This is a lot of information to take in, but once you understand how the interface works, development goes so much faster. I'd recommend having a look around each part of the interface on your own before heading into the next section. By the end of this lecture, you will have a scene that looks something like this as we begin creating our tank game. Firstly, we're going to create the ground for our scene. This will be the area where our tanks will drive around. Head into the hierarchy, right click, then select 3D object and cube. As you can see, this has added a cube game object into our scene view. If you can't see it, just double click on the cube inside of the hierarchy and you will go to its position in the scene view. It's good practice to reset the transform, so right click on the transform component of the newly made cube inside of the inspector, then click reset. Next, let's rename our cube to ground. Again, in the inspector, on the transform component, let's increase the scale of our cube. For this project, I think 12 is a good size. I'm also going to increase the Y scale to 10 and Y position to negative 12. Now, we have a simple platform setup, so let's move to our camera. Click on the camera in the hierarchy. Inside of the camera transform, let's set the position to minus 20 on the X and Z and then 5 on the Y. In terms of rotation, let's do 45 on the Y and divide that by 2 on the X. So it's actually possible to do calculations inside of the transform component. If you're not familiar, typically with programming, the slash is shorthand for divide. So entering 45 slash 2 will give us our number. To bring this all together, inside of the camera component, let's change the perspective to orthographic. I will just say here, feel free to take creative liberties on your personal scene throughout this course. You could use perspective projection on your camera, but I really like the feel of orthographic here. Next, change the clear flag setting to solid colour. I'm going to pick a nice blue here. As you can see, if you go to the game view window, we now have a pretty cool ground and camera setup. But our ground object is missing some colour. In Unity, we use these things called materials to define the appearance of our objects. So let's make a new folder in the explorer titled materials. Folder structure is super important to keep your game organised. So let's open the folder, right click and then create a new material. I'm going to name this ground mat. Next, drag this material onto your ground object. Make sure you're in scene view when you do this. With the ground mat selected, let's enter the inspector and change the colour. Now I'm going to give you a free reign here, have a mess around and make yourself a nice ground material. Personally, I'm going for a low poly look, but if you've got your own assets then feel free to do what you like here. So we have a nice low poly scene, but now we need a Player. Attached to this lecture is a zip file containing my low poly tank pack. Make sure to download then unzip this folder. Then just drag the whole folder into the explorer. If the textures don't load, just drag the color palette inside of the folder onto the models in the scene view. Okay, now this is looking pretty cool and a lot more like a game. If you've made it this far, congratulations, we now have our first scene set up and in the next section we're going to be adding player movement. In this video we will make our first script which is going to handle player movement. 
Here, we're going to focus on getting our movement up and running, and the following lecture will be a full breakdown of the code. So don't worry too much if you can't understand everything the first time around. Taking a practical approach to learning programming is much more beneficial at the beginning as I believe learning from experience consolidates information much better. Moving into Unity, the first thing we need to do is center our tank's pivot, as the center of our tank is a bit too far forward at the moment. We can do this by creating a parent object and moving it to the center of our model. Inside of the hierarchy, create a new empty object called player. Reset the transform of our newly created player object and then reset the transform of our player model. Select the player object and move it to the center of the tank. Next, inside of the hierarchy, drag our tank model into the new player game object. This will parent our model inside of the game object, allowing us to put all of our player related assets in one parent object. As you can see, if we move the player parent object, it will move all of the objects inside of it. Let's then create a new folder called Scripts. Right click and then create a new c -sharp script called Player Movement. Let's drag this script into our player game object in the inspector. Remember, you must have your player object selected in order to see it in the inspector. Double click on the script and it will open it in Visual Studio. If you've never seen code before, this may look a tad overwhelming. This is the default script that's created whenever we make a new script inside of Unity. Let's start at the top. The using keyword refers to namespaces that we're using in our script. This basically means a collection of functions we can use. For example, if we wanted to print some text, we might need a function to do that. Rather than spending time making that function ourselves, we can just use a namespace containing the function we want. So we've got these three lines where we're telling the script which namespaces we want to use. Next, we have our script name and then its base mono behavior class. This class comes from the Unity Engine namespace and includes loads of useful functions that we can use in our script. The curly braces are used as containment markers. So this means anything inside of the curly braces are then part of that object. So inside of player movement, we then have two functions, start and update. Start is pretty self-explanatory. Anything inside of this function will be called at the start of our game. Then anything inside of the update function will be called every frame of our game. I do just wanna say, don't worry if you didn't understand everything there. In the next video, we're gonna further explain all the code, but here we're just gonna try and get our player movement working. Let's start by creating two variables for our player movement and rotation speed. To do this, we start with the access level we want our movement speed to be. Here, I'm using public so we can access this from anywhere. Next, we define the type of variable that we want to use. I'm using a float, which basically means a decimal number. The reason we're using decimals rather than whole numbers here is because we'll be able to have more fine tuning over our speed. Then we type a name for our variable. Throughout this course, I'm gonna be using the camel case naming convention. This basically means whenever I'm naming a variable, the first word is lowercase, and when we start a new word, it's capitalized. This is all obviously up to you, but it's good practice to use industry standards. Plus, it's much, much easier to read. Then we write equals and give it a value. Here, I'm going to set the movement speed to 5f. We write f at the end because we're using a float. Then to show C sharp, this is an end of a line, we write a semicolon. There we go, there's our first line of code. We will then do the same for the rotation speed. Here, I'm giving it a value of 200f. Inside of the update function, we want to control our rotation first. To do this, we need access to the transform component of our player. So write transform.rotate. The rotation function requires three values to work. This will be in the same order as the transform component. First, we have the X rotation, which we don't want to change, so write zero. Then a comma. Now we do want to rotate our Y. Let's change it dependent on the user input. We can access the user input by simply typing input.getAxis. Then we're going to write horizontal and make sure you have a capital H here. The update function calls everything inside of it every frame. Now, this is a problem because people with faster computers with higher frame rates could get an unfair advantage. So to avoid this, we're going to times our input by a function called time.delta time. This is an interval in seconds from the last frame to the current one. The asterisk symbol just simply means multiply. Then we can times again by our rotation speed variable. Perfect. And 
and don't forget to add another comma and then zero to make sure we don't change our Z rotation. And finally, a semicolon to round off the line. We're going to use a similar line to do our vertical movement. Rather than rotating here, we're going to translate. Then we want to change the Z. So enter 0, 0 for our X and our Y, then input dot get axis and vertical. Next, times this by time dot delta time, and then times again by our movement speed variable. Don't forget the semicolon, and then that's it. Head back into Unity, click play at the top, and hopefully you should be able to control your tank. If your code isn't working, look for any spelling, capitalization, or syntax errors. If you still can't find the issue, rewatch this video or head to the next video where we're going to cover the code in more depth. Although, I do encourage you to find the errors in your code on your own, as debugging is a massive skill to have, and making mistakes is the best way to learn. If you've got your tank moving, congratulations, that's a massive step forward and this is starting to look like a game. In the next lecture, we're going to further explain the code and you should start to get a good grasp of all of these programming concepts. This lecture is optional as it's just a code explanation, but I highly recommend watching if you're new to programming or didn't understand everything in the previous video. Let's take a look at our movement script. Starting with the namespaces. The using keyword allows us to use other classes. For example, here we write using the Unity Engine namespace. This saves us time in our code when we want to use a function from that namespace. For example, without the namespace, if we want to log some text, we have to write Unity engine.debug.log hello world. But if we're using the Unity Engine namespace, we can simply just write debug.log hello world. Essentially, namespaces allow you to exclude typing that namespace all the time. Next, we have our public class. The public keyword means anything anywhere has direct access to whatever it is. Private, on the other hand, means only members of this class and by extension its children have access to it. So this is a public class. Classes are like blueprints for your objects. Basically, in Unity, all of your scripts will begin with a class declaration. Unity automatically puts this in the script for when you create a new c -sharp script. This class shares the name as the script file that it's in. Then, MonoBehavior is the base class from which every Unity script derives. Anything inside of the curly braces is part of this class. Then, we have our variables, which are containers that hold information for us. For example, if we wanted to change our movement speed, we can just change the movement speed variable and all of the code that uses that variable will be updated. This saves a lot of time as we don't need to go through the code and change every reference to the movement speed. We simply have one variable that we can just reuse and update. Moving on, we have the update function. The void keyword means this doesn't return anything. We could have a function that returns a number or a string, but when we have no reason to, we just simply write void, which means return nothing. The update function will call everything inside of it every frame. If we use the example from earlier to print some text, but we put it in the update function, we will see this prints in Unity every frame. Next, we have the start function. To be more specific, this is called on the frame when a script is enabled, just before any update methods are called. As you can see, logging text in this function will call it once. The green double slashes represent comments. This isn't actually executable code, but just almost notes in the code to explain things to people. I will say using comments is really good practice, especially if you come back to a program you haven't seen for a while, and then you can read the comments to sort of get a grasp of what you were doing. For example, the default script explains these two functions. One more little thing, notice our functions have capital letters. This is standard, so if your update function isn't calling every frame, this might be the reason. Anyway, if you're still confused about something, the Unity scripting documentation is fantastic. I'll put the link in the description of this lecture. Have a read if you're still curious about a topic or want to have a deep dive on something specific. Next, we're going to look at game physics and coroutines for player shooting. This is an optional lecture where we will go over the basics of programming. It's tradition to make a Hello World script first, so let's go ahead and do that. In the hierarchy, right-click and create a new empty object and call it Hello World. 
Then go to the inspector with this object selected and click add component and then type hello world. Make sure you have no spaces here. Then create and add the C sharp script. We can then double click to open it. Inside of the script you can zoom in and out using control and the scroll wheel. To make this more simple let's delete the update function and the green comments. When I was first learning Unity, I was always worried I would delete the wrong thing, but don't worry, if you do delete it, you can just add that curly brace back or just retype the code. All the functions and what they do will be explained in the player movement section, but for now, we're just interested in the start function. Inside of start, we want to log hello world. To do this, just write debug.log and then open some brackets. Then we use speech marks to specify what we want to print. Let's then write hello world and don't forget a semicolon at the end. Press Ctrl S to save your code. Now head back to Unity and click the play button. Then in the console tab at the bottom you should see that you've printed out some text. Fantastic, now let's head back into our script. We're going to make a string variable. We use these to store strings of text. So write string, then what we want to name our variable, I'm just going to call it word. Then do the same for our text. Back in the debug.log statement, we can delete hello world and now just write word instead. Head back into Unity and hit play and as you can see, it will print our text again. Variables are fantastic for storing all types of data. We can store whole numbers with int, which is short for integer. For example, we could make an int variable, call this num and then set it to 10. Strings and integers are known as data types. Another example of a data type is a bool or boolean. These boolean variables can only be true or false. So you can see variables have the format of data type, name and then the data that we want to store. When we put our isBlue variable into the log statement it will print false. Now we're going to use an if statement to check if our variable is false. If statements run the code inside of their curly braces if the statement is true. For example, let's write if, open some brackets, is blue equals equals false. This statement is true, so anything inside of the braces will run. So inside of these braces, let's log yes, it is blue. Back in Unity, hit play, and as you can see, we get our output. Biggest things to remember here is we have data types for different data, and we can use variables for storing this data. By the end of this video, we will implement player shooting alongside some projectile physics. Let's start by creating a projectile for our tank to fire. To do this, right click in the hierarchy and create a new cube. Rename this to bullet in the inspector. We want to enable physics on this object, so click add component and rigid body. Adding a rigid body component to an object will put it under the control of the Unity physics engine. Scale this down to 0.1 in the transform component and then enter your materials folder. Inside the folder, right click and add a new material. We can call this bullet and apply it to our cube. Then change the color of the material to whatever you like. Now we want to make this bullet into a prefab. Prefabs allow us to create, configure and store a game object complete with all of its components as a reusable asset. In our case we want to keep spawning multiple bullets at our tank's barrel. Using a prefab will allow us to spawn and reuse our bullet asset as much as we want. This also means we only need to make the bullet once. Making a prefab is very simple. Make a new folder, call it prefabs, then drag our bullets into this folder. As you can see it goes blue and whenever we drag a bullet from the folder we can see it creates a copy of our bullet. We also need a location to spawn our bullets from. Create a new empty game object and rename it to firepoint and position it at the location of the barrel. Make sure you offset this a little bit from the actual model just to avoid any collisions. Let's create a new script in our scripts folder called player shooting and attach it to our player. Next up we're going to open up this script and delete the default functions. Let's start by creating some variables to store information about our shooting system. 
First, let's make a public game object called projectile, and this will be a reference to our bullet prefab. Let's also make a transform variable for our fire point component. Let's also make a public integer for our bullet speed. Then a float for despawn time. We will despawn the bullet after a certain amount of time. Small tricks like this can really help with performance. Let's set this to 3F. We need a boolean variable titled shootable and set this to true. A boolean can be true or false. The reason for doing this is we don't want players to fire as fast as they can click. This means we can stop the player from shooting by setting this variable to false. Next, let's make a time to wait between shots. Head back into Unity and click on the player. Make sure you have actually got your script attached in the inspector. Inside of the shooting script, let's set our variables. So drag the bullet into the projectile variable and then the fire point into the fire point variable. Perfect, now let's head back into Visual Studio. Before we start coding, think about how we might use each of these variables to make our shooting system. Okay, start by creating an update function that will check if we have fired. We're using the update function because we want to check every frame if the player has fired. We do this by using the if keyword. This is a conditional statement and will only trigger if the conditions are met. So we want to check if the fire button is pressed. To do this, we write input.getKey and then our key code. I want left click to be my fire button, so I'm using mouse zero here. When the fire button is pressed, we want to shoot. So call a shoot function inside of our braces. Now we actually need to make that shoot function that we're calling inside of the if statement. So create a function called shoot with a void return value. Inside of its braces, create a variable called bullet, and this is where we're going to spawn our projectiles. The function instantiate will allow us to spawn game objects, but it requires three values. Firstly, a game object to spawn, then a position, and then a rotation. So the game object we want to spawn is our projectile, and then the fire point variable can be used for our position and rotation. So using firepoint.position and firepoint.rotation will allow us to spawn our bullet at the firepoint on the tank. We added a rigid body to our bullet game object inside of Unity. We need to manipulate the velocity of that object in order to get our bullet to move. To do this, we write bullet.getComponentRigidBody.Velocity equals bullet.TransformForward. Then we times this by our bullet speed. Finally, we need to despawn our projectiles so they don't clog up the scene. Simply write destroy, the object we want to destroy, which is our bullet, and then we can write a despawn time after this. In our case, we're going to use our despawn time variable we made earlier. Mega, let's test this in Unity. Quick side note here, make sure your fire point object is inside of your player object. As you can see, we can fire, but the only problem here is we can fire as fast as we can click. We need a way to disable our shooting between shots and make the player wait before firing. We can do this by using a coroutine. This will allow us to pause the current frame and resume it at the next frame. Coroutines are very useful for running asynchronous operations where you don't want everything happening at once. In our example, we want to enable firing after an amount of time. So we use the coroutine to halt the ability to fire based on the rate of fire variable. First, create another if statement inside of our current one. This will check if the shootable variable is true. Then move the shoot function inside of the new if statement. So if the shootable variable is true and the player has clicked, we will fire. Inside of this statement, we also want to set shootable to false. So when we fire, we disable our shooting. Now we need to enable it after some time. Create a new function with the I enumerator return type. This is an interface which when implemented allows us to iterate through a list of controls. In Unity, we use I enumerator as a return type for our coroutines. So inside this function, we can write yield return new wait four seconds. This function allows us to wait an allocated time. So we can set this to our wait before next shot variable. Then once we've waited some time, set shootable to true again. So essentially when we enter this function, we wait a bit and then set shootable to true. Then back in our shootable if statement, we need to start this coroutine whenever we fire. So under shoot, write start coroutine shooting yield. Back in Unity, set your variables and you will be able to fire dependent on your wait before next shot variable. Okay, a more complicated video today, but congratulations, coroutines are pretty hard to get your head around. But if you master them, they're a really powerful tool for game development.
In this lecture, we will use a state system to create some basic AI for our enemies. Firstly, we need our enemies to know where and what our player is. We can do this using tags. Tags are reference words which you can assign to one or more game objects. Let's assign a player tag to the player game object. Click on the player game object inside the hierarchy, then in the inspector, we can open down this drop down and click player. Next, let's create our enemy. Let's import another model from the low poly tanks pack. Again, make a parent object which will also be used as the object's pivot. We will also need a fire point just like our player. Create an empty object, position it at the enemy's fire point and make sure it's a child of the parent enemy object. Let's make a script for our enemy. Inside the scripts folder make a new c -sharp script called enemy AI. This will control our enemy and change its behaviour depending on the player's position. Our enemy will have three basic states. Idle, moving towards our player and attacking. Let's create the variables and this should become more clear. Starting off with some floats for speed, rate of fire, next fire time, line of sight and shooting range. Then a game object for our projectile and a transform for our player and their fire point. We'll also need a float for next fire time. Let's also delete the default comments. Mega, inside of the start function, let's find our player. Find game object with tag is a very useful function and does exactly what it says. So let's set player equal to game object dot find game object with tag player dot transform. Here we are setting our player variable to our player position using its transform component. We do this in the start function as we don't need to set this variable every frame in the update function. Now let's use some conditional statements in the update function to set our player's state. We want our enemy to face the player, luckily there's a function that does that for us. Write transform.look and then our target, which is the player variable. Let's update the distance from player, this will be equal to a vector3.distance, taking the inputs of player position and our transform.position for our enemy. This will give us the distance between the objects. Next, we're going to use conditional statements to specify which states our enemy should enter. First, let's check if our distance from our player is less than the enemy line of sight and our distance from player is greater than our shooting range. In this case, we want our enemy to move towards the player. We use a double ampersand if we want both conditions to be true before entering the if statement. So this code will check if our enemy is in its movement range. So let's actually make this movement inside of the if statement. We're going to set our transform.position to a vector3.move towards. Taking the inputs of this.transform.position, player position, our speed variable, and then timesing it by time.delta time. Let's do a similar check for firing whenever the player is in shooting range. We use the else if statement to specify a new condition if the first condition is false. So else if the distance from our player is less than or equal to our shooting range and next time to fire is less than time dot time. If all of this is true, let's instantiate our projectile. The inputs here being our projectile, the firepoint.transform.position and then also its rotation. We also need to update the next time to fire, so let's set that equal to time.time .time plus rate of fire. Next, we're going to use gizmos for some visualization of our variables. Let's make some spheres for our line of sight and shooting range. 
we can draw gizmos using the onDrawGizmoSelected function. Inside of the function, we first need to set our color. We do this by writing gizmos.color, and here I'm going to be using green. We draw our sphere by using the drawWireSphere function. This will take in the transform.position and our line of sight variable. Let's use a similar line for our shooting range. There's a gizmos button in Unity that you can use to toggle on and off your gizmos. Finally, we need a projectile for our enemy to fire. Let's create another bullet called enemy projectile. Create a cube and rename it to enemy projectile, then add a rigid body and a collider component. Exactly the same as the other projectile, we have a scale of 0.1 and then we're also applying the material we made earlier. Also, don't forget to drag this bullet into the prefabs folder to make it into a prefab. Then, inside of the scripts folder, let's make a new enemy projectile script and open it up. Let's make a float for speed, a game object for our target, and a reference to our rigid body. Then we're going to set our variables in the start function. To get the bullet rigid body, let's use get component and then rigid body. Our target will be equal to game object dot find game object with tag and then player. Now let's make a vector 3 for our move direction. This will be equal to target.transform.position minus transform.position. Let's normalize this value using the normalize function. Then times it by our speed variable. Next up, we need to set the rigid body's velocity. We can do this by using bulletrb.velocity. The inputs here are going to be our move direction.x, 0, and then our move direction.z. Let's also make sure to destroy the projectile after a couple of seconds. Again, using the destroy function. Head back into Unity and let's set our variables. Again, set your range to whatever you like. For example, maybe you want a close range enemy rather than a sniper. Make sure both of your projectiles are in the prefabs folder and you're assigning the prefabs to the script. The wire spheres you're seeing here are really good as they represent our variables, but don't worry, you won't be able to see these in game. Perfect, we've made some basic AI for our game. Next up, we're going to be covering a health system and also polishing our game up a little bit. In this lecture, we will create our health system. First up, let's polish this project up a little bit. Firstly, the projectiles in the scene are only prefabs, so we can safely delete them. Then, let's add a box collider component to our player and enemy. I also want to reduce the size of our player and enemies to about 0.8. We can do this using the transform component of each object. Inside of the prefabs folder, let's also make our bullet collider into a trigger. Now, let's enter our enemy AI script. Here, we're going to add a function to destroy the enemy when it's hit by a bullet. We can do this using the onTriggerEnter function. So, this will be called whenever the enemy is hit by a trigger. So, let's simply just write a destroy line in here. Now, we can test our game and the player can shoot and destroy the other tanks. Let's create a health system for our player. First, let's make some UI to display the player's health. Right click in the hierarchy, go to UI and select image. This will create an overlay image that will be played on the user's screen. To see this better, click on the 2D button at the top and then double click the new UI image. This is really useful for something 2D like UI, but then when we're moving around the scene, we might want 3D. This border is a representation of our screen. Let's scale our UI image in the inspector.
This first image is going to be my border. I'm going to duplicate it with Ctrl D, then change the color to a nice red and scale it down. Let's also rename this part to health bar. We need a way to change the fill of this health bar. All we need to do is import a sprite as a source image. With this lecture, I have included a blank sprite for you to download. Let's make a new folder called UI and add this sprite to it. Then, back on the health bar in the inspector, let's set this sprite as the source image. Now we have some more options so we can change the image type to filled and fill method to horizontal. As you can see, changing the fill amount will reduce and increase the health. Okay, let's make a C sharp script to control the player health inside of the scripts folder. First, let's add a new namespace at the top of the file called unityengine.ui. This allows us to access the UI components in the Unity engine. For our variables, we only need two, a public float for health amount, and let's default this to 100F. Then we need a public image for our health bar. In the update function, let's use conditional statements to check if a player has ran out of health. If the player health is less than or equal to zero, for now, we will just log game over to the console. Let's make a take damage function that will take in a float called damage. Then let's take the damage from our health and set the fill amount. We can do this using dot fill amount. So health bar dot fill amount equals health amount divided by 100. We need to call this function inside of the enemy projectile script. So go ahead and open up our enemy projectile script. Let's create a new on trigger enter function in the enemy projectile script. We first get a reference to the player health. This will be equal to hit info dot get component and then player health. It's good practice to make this reference to the script a lowercase version of the original title. Exclamation mark and equals just means not equal to. So if the player health is not equal to null, we then use the take damage function we just made. So player health dot take damage and our amount. Perfect, let's assign all of this inside of Unity. So add the health script to the player and then put the health bar UI image into this variable. I did run into a couple problems here. My enemy was destroying themselves and this was because their fire point was too close to their collider. So if you have the same problem, just move your fire point further forward. Also make sure both of your projectiles inside of the prefabs folder are triggers. Now, as you can see, when we are hit by an enemy, the player will take some damage. The game is really starting to shape up now, congratulations if you've got this far. This lecture will be slightly more complex as we delve deeper into the world of arrays, loops and coroutines. Our wave system will work by randomly choosing spawn points and then spawning enemies, while also progressively increasing the amount of enemies and reducing the time between each wave. Pause the video and have a think about how we might do this before continuing. We can break this down into a couple of questions. How do we spawn the enemies? What could we use to increase our amount of enemies and decrease the time between waves? And finally, how do we randomly choose a spawn point? Firstly, we make our enemy into a prefab and spawn it just like our bullets. We can use variables for spawn rate and enemy count which we can then conditionally change. We will also create some set spawn points in Unity. Then use a random function to generate a number which will decide which spawn point to pick. If this all sounds daunting, don't worry, we're going to go step by step. Okay, open up your Unity project and let's start by making some spawn points. Create an empty game object and rename it to spawn point. Make sure to reset the transform, just remember right click on the transform component and click reset. Then you can duplicate this with Control D. I'm going to use four, but feel free to make as many as you want. To avoid flying tanks, make sure to keep these at ground level. Let's also drag our enemy into the prefabs folder and then remove it from the scene.
Okay, inside of the scripts folder, let's make a new script called wave system. Let's make our variables. First, a float for spawn rate, and let's set this to 1f. Then, let's have another float for time between waves, and we can set this to 3. Next, we need a way to store all of our spawn point positions in one variable. Luckily, arrays allow us to do just that. Arrays allow you to store multiple objects in a single variable. To declare an array, we use square brackets. So let's make a public transform array called spawn pos. Let's make a game object variable for our enemy prefab. We need an integer for enemy count, and then another integer for random index. Finally, let's have a boolean to check if our wave is done and set this to true. Okay, we can delete the start function and the comments. Inside of update, we just need to check if the current wave is done. So if wave is done equals equals true, we want to enter a coroutine called wave spawner. Let's make that now. Make a new I enumerator called wave spawner. Make sure this is the same as the coroutine you just called in the update function. First, we want to pick a random spawn point, so let's use the random range function. So, set the random index to random.range. This will pick a random number between two of our chosen values. We have four spawn points, so you think the input should be one and four. But we're working with an array, and arrays don't start from one, they start from zero. So the first spawner in our array will be at zero. So now you'd think this would be zero and three, and normally you'd be right. But the random range function excludes the maximum number. So we write zero and four here. Sorry if that doesn't make total sense to you, but it's just how arrays work. Now, we need to spawn our enemies multiple times. To do this, we can use a loop. So, to make a for loop, we write for and then our conditions. This syntax might seem a bit alien, so follow along and I'll explain afterwards. For int equals zero semicolon i greater than enemy count another semicolon and then i plus plus. What we're saying here is keep running the code until i is greater than the enemy count. So we define i as zero and then set our condition for the loop. Here we increase i on each pass until it's greater than the enemy count. So if the enemy count was three, this would run three times. So let's spawn our enemy in the loop. Let's make a game object variable called enemy clone. This will instantiate our enemy. Then we need our position. The position will be one of our spawn points in the spawn pos array. But we need a reference to which one. We do this by using square brackets. We put the number of the one we want to use in the square brackets. But we want a random one, so let's use our random index variable. Remember, the instantiate function needs an object to spawn, a position, and then a rotation. So do the same for the rotation. Remember, the random number is the index for this too. Now we want to wait for our spawn rate. So we can use yield return new wait four seconds and then the spawn rate variable. Once we exit the loop, let's increase the difficulty. So let's take 0.1 off the spawn rate and add three to the enemy count. We can use minus equals and plus equals for shorthand here. Let's wait for our time between waves using the wait four seconds function again. Finally, then remember to set wave is done to true. Back in Unity, let's test this out. Let's make an empty game object and name it Game Manager. Then let's attach our shiny new wave script to it. Firstly, drag all of our spawners into the array. Make sure you have the number of spawners that you set in your script. For me, this was four. Let's drag the enemy prefab in and set the enemy count to one. Now you can test out your wave system. This system is really strong as it has increasing difficulty and it's technically infinite. Today we're making a menu system for our game alongside a game over state. I'm going to show you the tools to make menus but please try not to copy too much and make your own design.
Okay, let's go to the scenes folder and rename our current scene to level 1. Then create a new scene called menu and open it up. Let's use 2D view here as we're making UI. So click the 2D button. In the hierarchy, let's create a new UI panel. This will create a canvas parent object for us too. You can change the color of your background using this panel. Make sure you have full opacity here too. Next, I'm going to add an image. Right click on the panel and click UI then image. I'm going to add the course image here, but feel free to add whatever you like. Make sure if you are adding an image, you set your image import settings to 2D and UI. Then drag your image into the UI image component. Next, we're going to make some buttons. So right click, select UI and button. Feel free to style these as you like. I'm going to make two buttons, one for play and one for quit. Once you're finished editing your button, let's add some functionality. Inside of your scripts folder, create a new script called main menu. In this script, we need to access the scene manager namespace. This will allow us to change the current scene. So at the top, write using unity engine.scene management. Then we can delete all of the default functions. Then we need three of our own functions, play, quit, and menu. Make a public void play function. This will actually only need one line, scene manager .load scene, and then the name of our scene. It's important you put the exact name of the scene in here. Then let's do the same for menu. Public void menu, scene manager .load scene, and then menu. And finally, let's make a quit function. Inside of this function, you will just need one line again, and that's application.quit. It's worth mentioning the quit button won't work until we fully build the application. Okay, head back into Unity. Let's create a new empty in the hierarchy, call this game manager, and then add our new menu script to it. On each of the buttons inside of our UI, let's add click functions. We can then drag the game manager object in here and select functions from that script. Here, this is my play button, so I want to use the play function. Then let's do the same for the quit button. Now let's make a game over scene. Inside of the scene folder, duplicate the main menu scene with control D. Then let's rename this to game over. Let's change the buttons around a little bit. Let's have play again and main menu. Use the play function for play again and the main menu function for main menu. Now open up your player health script. Add in the Unity Scene Management namespace. Where we log to the console, we now want to display the game over screen instead. So write scene manager .load scene and then game over. To make this all work, there's one more step. We need to add our scenes to the build settings. Inside of Unity, go to File, Build Settings, and you'll see the scenes in your build. Drag in all of your scenes here. Now let's test the game from the menu scene. Okay, this is looking pretty good. And that's it. That's how you make UI inside of Unity. In this lecture, we're going to focus on addressing some bugs and polishing up our game. Let's start by grouping our spawn points into one parent object. In the hierarchy, create an empty object called spawn points and then drag all of our spawn points into it. We also want to add rigid bodies for our enemy and player to enable collisions. To do this, go to add component and then type in rigid body. Inside of the component, let's set no gravity and then freeze all of the rotations and the Y position. We also need to fix the colliders for the enemy and the player. Simply click on the collider component and you'll be able to drag each side of the box. Make sure you do all of this for the player and the enemy.
Now we need to make some walls. To do this we just make some cubes and then disable their mesh renderer. This allows us to create invisible walls for our player to collide with. So let's create a cube and then reset the transform. Then increase the scale. We can move this to where we want our wall. Then duplicate this wall three times and change the rotations. Once you have some walls, just disable the mesh renderer component. Then double check everything in play mode and make sure you can't escape the map. Next, I think the game is too hard, so let's reduce the enemy damage and spawn speed. We can go into the enemy projectile script and reduce the damage. And that's it, next we're going to start making some maps for our game. Today, we're going to be making some new levels. Let's start by duplicating our level 1 scene with Control D. Then in the materials folder let's duplicate our ground material. Change the colour of this material and apply it to the ground. You can also go ahead and change the sky in the camera component. Here I'm trying to make a bit of a desert scene. Let's also make some new enemies. Duplicate and rename the enemy in the prefabs folder. Feel free to experiment and change whatever you like here. I'm going to use the yellow tank from the tanks pack and then make them slightly faster. Then we can add this new enemy to the scenes game manager to spawn them in. Anyway, go ahead and have some fun on making some new levels. Once you've made your levels, let's add these to the build index. Go to File, Build Settings and drag them in. On the right you will see each scene has its own build index. Make sure your menu is first and your game over screen is last. We're going to use this build index to randomly pick levels. Open the main menu script. Let's make a new integer variable for random index. Then inside of the play function let's pick a random number using random.range. As I have 3 levels here I'm going to use a range of 1 to 4, as the random range function will exclude the maximum number. Now whenever we click play a random scene will load. Try and be as creative as you can with these enemies and levels, I would love to see some of them. Here we're going to round off the series by creating a final build application that you can use and show off wherever you want. So let's start by making an icon for our game. I've included some images of the tanks with this lecture if you're not feeling particularly creative today. Inside of your chosen image editing software make a new file 1024 by 1024. Go ahead and design an icon and make sure you export it as a PNG. Back in Unity, import your image, I'm just going to put it in the UI folder here. Make sure to set the import settings to 2D and UI. This is just so it can be used as an icon. Then head to project settings, go to player and icon and then choose your icon. Perfect, now all we need to do is build the project. Head to file, build settings, choose your target platform, in my case this is going to be Windows and click build. Feel free to go ahead and make a shortcut for this on your desktop too. Congratulations, you have made a fully fledged game. Feel free to join our discord and show off your new game, I would love to see some of these. With that all being said, thank you so much for watching and goodbye.